Hello, and welcome to SumSup, a channel about how to survive in the online jungle. My name is Bradley, and today we're going to talk about face recognition systems. How do they work? Can they be hacked? And what technologies are the most secure? Just take a look at this flickering hellscape. No, this isn't some video from a terrible nightclub. If you've got an iPhone with Face ID, this same projection covers your face every single day. And if you actually disassemble your iPhone and take a look under the hood, so to speak, you'll find a dot projector that creates over 30,000 invisible dots on your face. And this is how it effectively builds your face map. Now, human beings recognize other people's faces thanks to an area of the brain called the fusiform gyrus. At four months of age, we begin to recognize the faces of others. Our brains begin to single out the key points of the face. For instance, the eyes, the nose, the mouth and eyebrows. And this allows us to identify a person looking at pretty much one half of their overall face. Basically, our brain averages all of the faces it sees and then identifies deviations from this average. And there are tons of facial recognition methods. I'm not going to bore you with terms like the Delaunay triangulation or the Viola Jones methods. Uh, instead, I'll try to explain everything in layman's terms using visualization. A face recognition system creates so-called landmarks or points of the face. These locate the face and then distinguish key contours such as the left eye, the right eye, the left eyebrow, the right eyebrow, nose, lips, and so on. The device eventually obtains an image of you that looks something like this. Now, the next step is drawing a mask. The mechanism here is based on triangulation and uses those landmarks that we've already talked about. Now, this is what that process looks like. Circles are drawn between every three points. The vectors are then added to the circles. The result is a mask that looks something like this. By the way, the same mechanism powers masks in popular apps such as Masquerade, for instance. Landmarks are simply bound with 2D or 3D projections. If the face moves, then the landmarks track its position, in turn, helping the mask to adapt. People have been trying to fool biometrics for a long time now. For instance, this is how spoofing attacks were presented in the early 90s. Retina coding accepted, Warden William Smithers. Be well. Yeah, you too. You can see here that the overall principle is correct. Criminals need to outwit a biometric sensor by presenting counterfeit biometric evidence for a valid user. Our task, therefore, is to protect the system from being fooled. For anti-spoofing measures, two parameters are of great importance. The first one is the false reject rate. This is when an honest user, for whatever reason, cannot be identified by the system and gets labelled as a scammer. As such, this user is denied access and <laughs> smashes their phone against the wall. The second one is the false acceptance rate. This is the inverse, when a scammer is misidentified as an honest user. What really matters here is gaining a balance. Perfectly balanced. We need to, on the one hand, protect against criminals, but on the second hand, we need to avoid these false accusations of law-abiding users. The release of the iPhone X sparked much debate around facial biometrics. The technology has since become widely accessible and is used in a variety of different areas. People have tried literally everything to deceive Face ID. They've tried photos. Oops, didn't work. As we know, Face ID is a 3D technology. Pre-recorded videos and images projected on phone screens didn't fool the sensor either. Then, professional mask makers took a stab at defeating Face ID, but to no avail, unsurprisingly. The iPhone remained undefeated. Still locked. Hmm. In fact, when Apple first unveiled their Face ID feature, they specifically mentioned that spoofs involving masks would be rejected. So at first, the only way to defeat this Face ID feature was with either identical twins or triplets. Should I do it? Yes, do it. Oh, no! And I'm in! I'm in. But we can hardly call this a hack, right? I mean, could scammers really use this as a method in the real world? I don't know. I mean, okay, if I had a twin brother, I could read his messages, but there are no secrets between twins anyway. But then, no more than a week after Face ID was released, a Vietnamese company named BKAV finally defeated this biometric technology using a mask. Unlike traditional silicone masks, this mask was made on a 3D printer using stone powder and its eyes were 2D infrared images glued on a 3D model. 
Now to prove their success, BKAV recorded a video. They set up Face ID and demonstrated that all security settings were on and that the mask easily unlocked the iPhone. Vâng. Rất là dễ dàng. This particular hack uses the same principle as identical twins. That's why the developers called this mask the artificial twin. And all it took was about $200 to create. And by the way, Apple claims that Face ID is much more secure than, for instance, fingerprint sensors. But whereas fingerprint sensors have a 1 in 50,000 chance of making a mistake, for Face ID, the chance is around 1 in a million. Now, as far as the real world is concerned, it's really unlikely that scammers will have the motivation, the technology, or the funds, or even spy secrets to regularly defeat Face ID in this way. Another popular technology is called liveness. Now, this is used by many services worldwide to determine whether or not a person on the other end of the phone or computer screen is in fact a real person. Computer says no. These kinds of checks are essential for online services such as crypto exchanges or car sharing, or really wherever you need verification and KYC slash AML procedures. Basically, new users are asked to move their head around in front of a camera during registration. Now, this is how companies tend to battle things like payment fraud, account takeovers, as well as bot and presentation attacks. That's when scammers misrepresent themselves with masks or digital images, for example. Now, at first glance, liveness may resemble that of Face ID. But these technologies have really different tasks. I mean, Face ID, on the one hand, compares two faces, one that's stored in the iPhone and another that's presented to the camera. Now, the system therefore needs to determine whether, in fact, those faces match. On the other hand, liveness needs to understand whether a person is a human being rather than, say, a photo, a mask, or just another presentation attack. So let me explain how liveness actually works. Well, first of all, it needs to scan a face to create a 3D map. It then analyzes specific properties about the image, like noise, texture, and glare. The way our skin reflects light differs from silicone masks or phone screens. They have much more smoother textures. But what's interesting here is that a neural network detects what the human eye cannot. So, when this image is uploaded into the system, it's processed in depth, and the system can easily identify forgery, for instance. Now, if you move your head in front of a camera, the image might get affected a little bit. So, as a person gets closer to the lens, the proportions of their face may not change evenly. For instance, their nose might get bigger. Now, liveness technology is basically designed to adapt and interact with these changes. So, when a person turns their head, for instance, the system executes multiple checks, making it virtually impossible for someone to pass using a static image, for instance. And this is why liveness is so good at actually determining whether or not there's a real human being standing on the end of that camera. And one of the most reliable methods today uses cameras that actually capture how blood moves within the vessels of the face. There was actually an experiment that was carried out using Samsung phones, during which blood flow beneath the face was repeatedly measured. Turns out this method guarantees 100% accuracy for determining whether a person is real or not. Yes, it's kind of creepy, but it's working. To sum up, I'd say that you can pretty much hack anything given the necessary resources. The key component here needs to be the motivation, right? But anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next week. Be safe.